Well, good morning, everyone. Let, uh, let me start off by saying thank you very much for welcoming me into your homes here this morning. And it's wonderful for me to be able to join you for a time of worship and prayer. But you know, there's been something that's been bothering me for a little while. We must remember that we are all God's children and he's our father. And when he calls us back into his house to join him, we, as obedient family members, should obey that call. And we should come back into his house on a Sunday and just spend time in his presence, worshipping him and saying thank you for all he's done for us. You know, for myself, when I choose not to, to go through to church on a Sunday, I feel there's something missing in my life. I feel like I've almost been disobedient to my father. Well, today is a very special day in the Christian calendar. Today is Transfigural Sunday, the day Jesus took Peter, James and John up onto a high mountain to pray. And while they were there, something wonderful happened. But right now, let's just leave that because we'll cover that in our gospel reading in Luke a little later on. Let us, first of all, come together in a time of worship as we join together reading Psalm 103. If you have your Bible nearby, please open up to Psalm 103 and I'm going to be reading from verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Let us just close our eyes, think upon those words, think upon the, the compassion of our father, and let us come into his presence and ask him as he shone in the life of Jesus while he was here on earth, that he may shine in us and through us, that we may become beacons of true truth and compassion and to fill us with wisdom and to fill us with grace so that we may enlighten all those around us with deeds of justice and mercy. Amen. Well, as I promised, the gospel reading that I've chosen for today is Luke 9, and I'm reading from verse 28. About eight days after Jesus had said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him, and they went up onto a mountain to pray. As they were praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as as the flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his, his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them all, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. 
a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. This is the word of our Father. Praise be to God. Well, as I said before, today we're going to be talking about transfiguration. But let me start off by explaining that transfiguration does not mean the same as transformation. Transformation implies a remaking of the nature of a person or an object. Very much like a caterpillar becomes a beautiful butterfly. That's transformation. Transfiguration, on the other hand, implies the revelation of the true nature of the true self. Jesus is not transformed on the mountaintop that day. He goes up. He doesn't go up the mountain like some caterpillar and emerges a glorious butterfly full of light and beauty. No, what happens there is that Jesus stands revealed. It's as if a mask is taken from his face and the disciples are granted a vision of his true inner self, the Son of God, just as God the Father sees him and loves him. And in this transfiguration event, the disciples see through the human body to the soul of his inner being, to the love and the power that is Jesus Christ. The transfiguration of Jesus was a vision. It was a glimpse of the true glory of the King. It was a special revelation of Jesus' divinity to the three disciples that day. It was God's divine affirmation of what Jesus had done and what he was about to do. To explain the transfiguration in a way we can understand, we're all familiar with moments in our lives when we're among people that we know and love when we see the face of a child completely completely transfigured with joy at some gift or unexpected event that's been given to them, it's as if we are peering into their very soul through the layers of dirt and chocolate cake on their face and seeing them as they truly are on the inside. Conversely, we have seen someone so overcome with anger and frustration that their faces become transfigured as well. It's frightening to see how people become on the inside and it, became, and it can become quite disillusioning as well, almost scary. By now I'm sure you're familiar with the background as we've read in in the Gospel of Luke. So today, I really want to talk about that mountaintop experience because it is significant enough event that it's presented to you in three of the four Gospels. Why? Well, let's look at Peter, James and John. In many ways, they're just they are just like you and I, ordinary people trying to do the work that God has given them as best they can. It's like us. Sometimes we do well. Sometimes we just fall apart when we fall short of God's glory. And sometimes we just don't get it at all. And as faithful, hard-working disciples, we often find that work so demanding and sometimes exhausting, don't we? Now, 
just look at what transpired in the days and weeks before Peter, James and John climbed that mountain. Firstly, Jesus sent the disciples out into the surrounding villages and he told them to go and tell the people there about the kingdom of God. And he told them to go and heal the sick. He also told them not to take any money or food or clothing with them. That must have been a very difficult task for them. Then they were involved in a miracle where they had to feed 5,000 people. They had been completely overwhelmed. And then, as a reward for all their hard work and sacrifices, Jesus emphasizes that the demands put on his followers will be hard. But he also says to them that he has overcome this world. Just before going up that mountaintop, Jesus tells his disciples that they must deny themselves and that they must take up the cross daily and follow him. And so should we. Today, this is a very difficult task. No wonder there are so few of us sometimes willing to do what the church asks us to do so difficult to find people to help. So you can imagine what the disciples must have been feeling at that time. They may have been asking themselves this question, just what sort of power are we invoking? And I guess that they needed a little reinforcement, a little confidence as to the God they were serving. So Jesus takes the three disciples, Peter, James and John, up onto that mountaintop where he, he is transfigured right before their very eyes. As we've just read, his face shone like the sun and his clothes became bright as lightning. And then all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah appear. And they admit, and they say to Jesus, we are here. And then what happens? A cloud envelops the disciples, and God speaks directly to them. And he says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. This had to be an awe-inspiring moment. For those disciples. The clarity and the energy of that moment must have made them feel that it was all worthwhile. All that hard work on the previous weeks and months must have been worthwhile. Don't we from time to time in our lives get glimpses of those mountaintop experiences? Those moments when God's presence feels so real to us, we feel as though he's standing right beside us. Things that, that he's so powerful can, it, can only be described as being divine. When we feel enveloped by his love and by that peace and that comfort and that strength and wisdom that can only come from him. I'm sure all of you have had moments like that. Think about them. And don't we wish, like the disciples, we could stay in that moment forever, stay on that mountaintop forever? I'm sure you've all had that feeling, as Peter did. And he said, can't we put up three tents just to stay here, to linger a little while longer? But no, they couldn't stay there. There was work for the disciples to do. Jesus sent them back down the mountain where they once again had to deal with the suffering and the trials and the demands of this earthly life. And that 
same holds true for us today. Jesus sends us, you and me, out there. He sends us out into that mission field, the mission field of our homes, our workplaces, our communities, and to the world around us. He sends us out to deal with the hurting, the lonely, those that are sick, those that are spiritually broken, out into a broken world that's difficult and indifferent. You know, I'm reminded of the words of Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message. And he said, There is a spiritual war in progress, an all-out battle. There is evil and cruelty, unhappiness and illness. There is superstition and ignorance, brutality and pain. God is in the conscious and the energetic, he's in a conscious and energetic battle against all of it. God is for life and against death. God is for love and against hatred. God is for hope and against despair. God is for heaven and against hell. There is no neutral ground in this universe. Every square foot of space is contested. That's why Jesus calls every one of us to take up our cross, to follow him and be his disciples in this world here today. And so on, on, on this Transfigurational Sunday, let us recap the full meaning of what happened on that, on that day up on the mountaintop. Firstly, it was a lesson for the disciples about who Jesus was. It revealed to him, revealed to them the inner parts, inner makings of Jesus. It, secondly, it demonstrated the authority of Jesus. Remember what God said. Thirdly, it confirmed that the kingdom of God would be characterized by glory. And then, fourthly, it is the key to understanding the cross of Jesus, what it means, and the full realization of his death and resurrection. Those are the four important elements that come out of today's reading. The Transfiguration was a special event in which God allowed certain apostles to have a privileged spiritual experience that meant to strengthen their faith for the challenges that they would later have to endure. In the same way, at certain times in this life, God may give you certain members, may give certain members, not all of us, but special people sometimes, special experiences of his grace, of his strength and of his faith. Let us just reflect on those words for a moment as we close our eyes and we thank the Lord for those mountaintop experiences, for those mountaintop moments when we have felt so wonderfully close to him and felt his presence so near to us. And let us thank him for always being there with us. But may we also remember his love that comes through from him and to a dedicated life that we have, dedicated to serving him. And may we all be willing to take up our crosses and go into that mission field, into this fallen world of sin, to share his love, his hope and his joy with all those around us. Amen. Amen. Well, before we close, I have a question for you. Do you or any of your families need transfiguration? That's the first question. The second question is, 
how can we use transfiguration to change the lives of our community and our area that we live in? As we ponder these questions, let us join our spiritual hands as we bless each other and as we share the grace. Let's say the grace together. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. So, as we close, I say to you, remember to go in love, to go in peace, and to remember God's love is all around you. Embrace it. Shalom. Have a wonderful Sunday.